So Peacock Chapter 7 is on super molecular structure. And so we're going to look at solid state morphology, crystallization, characterization of structures in the polymer systems. First of all, uh, various states of polymer solids can be categorized based on the way that they move. Uh, and so typically it also deals with the level of organization in each of the states that the polymer is able to uh, exist in. Specifically, we're going to look at the polymer melt, the rubbery amorphous phase, the glassy amorphous phase, and then we're going to take a look at what defines a semi-crystalline material uh, and what sets that apart uh, from the other phases. So the molten polymer really has the lowest level of organization. Uh, the polymer chains are in a, a very high state of thermal agitation. If we could visualize that surface, the polymer chains would just be in constant motion, rapid motion. This uh, has associated with it a large free volume. Uh, in other words, the chains are moving so quickly that um, due to those vibrations along the backbones of the chains, if we were to look at two polymer chains that are adjacent to each other and do a time average or something uh, along those lines, we would see that there are these, these voids that would exist in between uh, these individual polymer chains that we're going to be calling free volume just because that motion uh, between those two chains uh, necessitates having some kind of a, a, an elbow room or some space in, in which uh, those chains can move. Of course that little drawing was was exaggerated but that's the idea. Uh, that there's that free volume in between. Uh, and so low modulus equals high flexibility uh, if you have a high modulus, you usually think of the material being more rigid. And so, of course, during these transitions, the polymer will experience different uh, changes in that modulus, going from a rigid, glassy polymer uh, at low temperature and then increasing in flexibility or decreasing in modulus as we uh, go up in temperature. And eventually, we would uh, achieve viscous flow of that material which is the state that the polymer would be in in the screw of an injection molder before it's uh, plunged into the mold. So uh, the rubbery amorphous phase first of all uh, is kind of a, an in-between uh, phase because it has uh, some similarities to the melt, the completely molten phase, and so it's it's similar in, in the type of movement that those polymer chains are able to undergo. However, the movement is slower. Uh, it's slower due to a lower temperature. And so the average kinetic energy, the temperature, uh, being lower manifests itself in um, a lower degree of agitation, lower degree of movement, but still a, a substantial degree of movement, just not quite as high as it is in the melt. Um, and so in that rubbery amorphous phase, which remember is in between the, the glassy phase and the molten phase, it's that in between transition, uh, there is decreased free volume, which is a direct result of that lower temperature and therefore lower uh, average kinetic energy. So in this uh, phase, the polymer behaves in a non-Newtonian fashion. Rem remember that uh, um, this is the range where you get viscoelasticity. So under light pressure, uh, the polymer chains uh, basically act as springs. They will, they will load under that pressure and then spring back. Uh, however, if you apply greater force, then that uh, polymer can permanently deform uh, due to disentanglement. And, and viscous flow uh, and that's the part that um, <clears throat> gives you that viscous effect as those polymer chains are uh, pressed into uh, a different form. Uh, so if we're going to utilize that rubbery amorphous 
phase and and give any kind of longevity to it, it must be cross-linked uh, in order to uh, lock in those desired rubbery characteristics. And so often elastomers are materials that uh, are in that rubbery amorphous stage, uh, but because of physical cross-links, uh, they are unable to, to f basically deform and flow. And so you lock in uh, the elasticity, but you shut down the ability of viscous flow. And so this is the process of vulcanizing rubber. Uh, when you're making that cross-link uh, between individual polyisoprene chains, it no longer is able to, to flow and you get a very tough rubbery material. That's kind of a, a side note uh, because we're, we're mostly going to be talking about chain motions, but uh, when we think about the rubbery phase, we probably often think of tire rubber or rubber bands. And uh, even though those do exist in this uh, regime, they really just focus on the, uh, the elasticity part due to those cross links uh, and the viscous effects are shut down. So polymer chains, uh, uncross link polymer chains, that is, are able to undergo reptation. Reptation uh, has a same similar root uh, as reptile, which uh, is trying to underscore this snake-like movement that chains in the rubbery amorphous phase can undergo. Uh, and so we've compared it to a plate of spaghetti or a pit of snakes. Uh, and so in this phase, uh, that motion that we uh, propose and, um, and uh, believe is responsible for that rubbery amorphous phase really is like snakes crawling in a pit and we'll take a pic we'll take a look at the picture of that here in a moment but there's there's two types of motion in this regime uh, the rubbery amorphous phase you have reptation and crankshaft rotation of the backbone of the chain and so we'll look at, at both so I know that uh, snakes are often not the most popular animal for whatever reason they seem to uh, awaken fear in people but um, but this video is is really instructive because this is really about as good of a picture as we can get of polymer chains migrating in a um, migrating in a rubbery amorphous phase or or a melt and so if we set that to motion there you see that the they're finding uh, holes to crawl through. There is definitely entanglement there. Uh, this type of uh, uh, behavior with snakes uh, being in these communal clusters is, is, from what I understand, fairly common. And so this was a naturally occurring den of, of snakes that someone photographed. And so we see that they're all moving in that forward direction. So there is one breakdown in that analogy, and that is uh, these snakes, these polymer chains in quotation mark are all going in one direction, the forward direction. In a polymer melt there would be a more randomized forward and backward motion uh, instead of this perpetual forward motion. So that's one breakdown in that analogy. But this picture really does give us a good idea of what this seething surface of a, uh, a rubbery amorphous uh, polymer material or a polymer melt would look like. Uh, the next one gives a slightly different perspective. Uh, this one is taken uh, kind of from the perspective of of uh, being down in that pit of snakes. You get kind of that horizon. So if we could take a cross section and see the surface of a polymeric material, uh, my imagination would say that this is somewhat what that would uh, appear to be. So now we are kind of down in that melt and uh, we're going to observe uh, these snakes, these polymer chains going past our vantage point. And so, so this is reptation. Uh, this name came, uh, was named by Pierre de Gen, very famous Nobel Prize winning French uh, scientist. Uh, definitely has my, my respect, very brilliant man. Uh, and this was the uh, the picture that he envisioned of these polymer chains moving through that uh, material. So I think we got the the point there. 
reptation. So the other motion associated with this um, thermal region of a polymer material is crankshaft rotation. So if we consider the chain, the backbone chain, uh, we've got these covalent bonds that are single bonds. And so single bonds are free to rotate. So there'll be these, these puckers in that uh, chain that will rotate much in the same way uh, that a crankshaft would rotate. You get these, these uh, individual uh, folds or, or puckers along that backbone that are then sort of uh, undergoing this crank-like rotation. So uh, some of you may be more familiar with uh, automotive uh, crankshaft design than others and so here's a simple example a four-cylinder crankshaft uh, that's driving the piston so if you ignore the pistons this is a diagram uh, animated gif from Wikipedia but just focus on that red crankshaft and imagine that occurring ironically also superimposed on top of the reptation that you observe there would also be this crankshaft rotation so another dimension of that thermal motion but there's this concerted uh, rotation of these these uh, folded regions of the backbone of the chain short regions just uh, dealing with three four uh, maybe five six seven carbons in in concert but uh, these different regions manifesting this thermal agitation throughout that that backbone uh, now this is again a little bit oversimplified because this is showing a a one direction rotation that's very uniform when in reality there would be these types of motions but they would be in both the forward and backward direction more randomized along the backbone but reptation and uh, crankshaft rotation those are really uh, the best uh, ways to view the thermal regime that makes a rubbery amorphous polymer rubbery and amorphous. It's, it's the ex ability of these motions to exist uh, in that polymer backbone.